Hey, 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 hey! You know, sometimes you just want to know what variables predict things. That's all. Yeah, uh, a whole lot of my curriculum is for targeting tested hypotheses. But sometimes you just got a bunch of predictors and you want to know, hey, which one of these best predicts the outcome? In those situations, it is lovely, if not recommended, to use random forests. Of course, random forest isn't the only thing you could use. There are other things you could use, but I like random forest and it works really well. And I'll leave links to random forest models so you can learn about that if you want to. And what random forest does is it computes something called variable importance, which shockingly is a measure of how important each variable is in the prediction model. They got very creative with the name. And so usually what people do is they use random forests to compute variable importance for all the variables and then use that to rank order the variables and then select variables from there. But a lot of people want to know, how do I do it? So it's nice to know the rank ordering of which variables are most important, but what's the cutoff? Is it the first two variables, three variables, 10 variables, 100 variables? I don't know. Sounds like an empirical question, does it not? Yes, by golly, it does. So there are two procedures that I have experience with. One, when I worked as a biostatistician, I learned about the VSERF algorithm, which stands for variable selection using random forest. Now we're talking cool names. VSERF, variable surfing. Yeah. It's like surfing the web. We're just kind of like playing around and that's kind of how it is with data, you know, in these situations, you know, you just, you're just playing around with data. You just want to find the best predictors. And I will leave a link in the description to the original authors of this algorithm. And basically VSurf has three steps, just three. The first one is the threshold step. And that's really just to get rid of the noise get rid of the variables that have no meaningful contribution whatsoever to the model. So to do this, the VSERF algorithm basically runs a random forest with the same variables. Let's say you've got 100 variables and it's going to run random forest and build a forest from those 100 variables. But then it's going to do it again and then again and then again. And it might do it like 20 times, 30 times, 50 times. I think 50 is the default. And why in the world would you do that? Um, just to show off your computer skills. I totally did that when I was in graduate school. Every time um, I got a new computer. Actually, I guess I still do that. Every time I get a new computer, I run a simulation just to see how fast it is. Because I'm nerdy like that. Who needs these stupid benchmarks? Like, oh, what are they called? Geek bench. That's what I was trying to remember. I knew it either had the word geek or nerd in it. Anyway. That's what you do when you are a quantitative graduate student and you want to test the power of your computer. You run simulations. So, uh, besides showing off the um, phenomenal cosmic power, phenomenal cosmic power of your computer, there's another reason for it. See, the thing is, when you build one forest, it computes variable importance once. So you get one estimate of the variable's variable importance. But if you run 50 forests, then you can get an average variable importance and you can get a standard deviation of that variable importance. Now, why would you ever want to compute a mean and a standard deviation? Oh, wow, good question. Lass, the reason why you'd want to compute both is simple, isn't it? Yeah, the reason why you want to compute both is because you can use variability information to make hypothesis testing like decisions, like we're gonna do here. And so basically what they're doing is they're using the mean variable importance with its standard deviation and seeing if the minimum 95% confidence interval or whatever it is, is above a certain threshold. That's basically what it does. So that's the threshold step. That's, so that's the, th so that is the threshold step. Took me several times to get that word phrase correctly. That is the threshold step. All right, uh, that is the threshold step. The second step is the interpretation step. And this basically helps you identify those variables that are best for interpretation, I guess. The, these are the variables that are worthy of further exploration. Something like that. And so what this does is it builds a model with just the most important variable, and then the most, and then the second most, and then the most, second most, and third most. 
most, second most, third most, fourth most, etc. So basically, if you have 20 variables remaining, it's going to build 20 random forests, but each of those random forests is going to build, again, 20 times, because we need that standard deviation of the error rate. But this time, instead of computing variable importance, because we've already done that, this time we're going to compute the out-of-bag error, or the prediction accuracy of your model, basically. So let me say that again, but more concisely. If you have 20 variables, you're going to build 20 models, one with one variable, one with the first and the second, one with the first, second, third, etc. And for each of those models, you're actually going to build that model like 20 times. And you're going to compute the prediction accuracy of your model. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to find the model that has the smallest out-of-bag error rate, or the best prediction accuracy. With some accommodation for the standard error, because you have standard error, so why not use them? So that is the interpretation step, and then the final step is called the prediction step, which um, it didn't occur to me until now that I don't know that that makes sense. Because um, interpretation is basically these are the variables worth looking at, and then prediction is this is your final model. But I always use random forests as an interpretive tool anyway. I never use it to build a final model because random forest models themselves are kind of useless, kind of, sort of. That's kind of a controversial take, but um, I've already said something like that before, and I will link in the description um, some discussion I had with a fellow YouTuber and some other statisticians about the usefulness of parametric statistics. Anyway, but the last step is called the prediction step, and you're just trying to find a model that maximizes your cross-validation accuracy. And to do so, it's going to be similar to the other step where it's going to start with the highest variable importance variable and then the first and the second and then the first, second and third. Except this time, it's only going to add like the second or only going to add the third if it improves the predictions enough to justify it. And there's some sort of threshold there and I don't remember the details of the threshold. In other words, it's not guaranteed that you're going to add a variable to the model. So you might have the first, second and fifth most important variables and skip the third and the fourth. So that's the vSurf algorithm. Now, pros of using vSurf. One, it allows you to flex the muscles of your computer. <sighs> yeah, it allows you to show off your computing skills. Um, I say that somewhat sarcastically. It is actually kind of fun. Um, I got a computer less than a year ago and it was fun running this algorithm and seeing it happen fairly quickly. That's awesome, but uh, that's not really a good pro. But a good pro is actually that it gives you an objective answer. And in the world we live in now, in the scientific world at least, objective answers are considered cool. Although I've written a paper about why we need to not adhere to the objective, objection, ob object, objective criteria in science and why ambiguity is actually a good thing. I'll link that paper in the description. Uh, but still, some people uh, like the safety of knowing there is an objective answer. And that objective answer is based on research and it's based on a published article. So it kind of, in a way, gives you a cop-out. <laughs> if a reviewer criticizes you, you're like, hey, that dude published the paper, not me. If you got a problem with it, talk to him, them, individuals, multiple people on that paper. Anyway. Um, another pro of the vSurf package is, an, or another pro of the vSurf algorithm is that it's easy. And I'm going to, actually, let me do that again. And I'm going to super emphasize that. It is easy. Um, in that, uh, you just run one line of code and it does all those steps for you. Um, I will explain the air quotes in like 38 seconds. Now I feel obligated to like splice this video so that it actually happens at exactly 38 seconds. All right, the cons of vSurf. It is computationally intensive. Unless you're trying to show off your computer, eh, you probably don't want something that's computationally intensive. That means you may have to wait a while, depending on how big your sample size is and how big your data set is. The biggest problem I think with vSurf is that it uses a biased estimate of variable importance. I'm just now realizing it's totally not gonna be 37 seconds. Darn, because this part's going to take a bit to explain. 
So it uses a biased estimate of variable importance. What do I mean? There are multiple ways that you can assess the importance of a variable. Um, there is a quick and dirty way called like uh, the mean node decrease in accuracy or something like that. Um, that basically all it requires you to do is go back and compute some statistic on all the little decision trees that you create with your reinforced. A much more computationally intense way is called permutation variable importance. And I believe I've talked about that and I'll leave a link in the video. And basically what that does is that for every of these decision trees and for every variable, it shuffles the scores and computes the variable importance before versus after shuffling the scores. And if there's a big difference, that tells you that variable was super important. Why? Because you have, by randomizing it or shuffling it, you have broken any association that variable had with the outcome. And so if you see a big difference, you can say, hey, I'm pretty certain this variable is not random. And it turns out that the quick and dirty method actually is a biased estimate of variable importance. And it's biased in that variables with lots of different levels. So if you have a continuous variable where each individual has a unique score, so let's say there's 500 people in the data set, there are 500 unique scores on that variable. It's going to get a boost in variable importance relative to like a categorical variable, like male and female or something like that. And so there's this constant upward bias of variables that are continuous and downward bias of those variables that are not continuous. I have recently perused, I haven't studied extensively the documentation on vSurf, but it seems like they haven't fixed that problem yet. Um, which is unfortunate because I think it's a cool algorithm um, with a fatal flaw. Like that's a big deal that it has this biased estimate of variable importance. And actually, funny story, um, when I worked as a biostatistician, so this would have been like 2014, 2015, um, I was really excited about vSurf but frustrated by that. And so I rewrote the algorithm myself to use permutation variable importance. Uh... And then I didn't maintain it. So, <laughs> so I don't know uh, that variable is online on GitHub, but I don't know that it would even work right now. One of these days I ought to uh, contribute to the vSurf package and add that someday. Or maybe they should. So if you wrote the vSurf package, Gnuer, I think is the ne guy's name. I don't know how, how to pronounce it, but hey. That's my recommendation. Rewrite it so it uses permutation variable importance. All right, that's the biggest con I think of vSurf. Uh, the last con I, or the last problem that I have with vSurf, and this is just me being an arrogant programmer. Um, so I have been a package developer for a long time, and whenever I create a package like Flexplot, um, I try to think about the user and think what would be the most useful information to give them and what would be the easiest way for them to use this algorithm. And in some ways, vSurf is super easy because it's just one line of code and it does everything. But then interpreting the output is crazy annoying. Um, I think the biggest problems, I think the biggest problem that it has is that instead of returning the variable names, it returns an index number, and then you have to do some digging to figure out which variable is being indexed. It's really weird and kind of frustrating. And I will show you some examples of doing that here in a bit when we step into R. So those are the big cons of vSurf. And by the way, package developer of vSurf, I say that with the utmost love in my heart for vSurf. That frustrates me to no end to use. <laughs> All right. My approach. Um, so I kind of, uh, I used to use vSurf all the time. But again, um, and then, like I said, I liked the algorithm enough that I rewrote the algorithm so that it would use permutation variable importance. So why did I stop using it? Well, I kind of developed a different approach that in some ways I like better, in some ways it's inferior. So my approach is far more subjective. And so basically it consists of four steps. The first step is that we fit a random forest model with all the variables, but we don't do it like 50 times. Although that might be a good idea to do it, but we're just gonna do it once. Then after that, we select the top four variables in terms of variable importance and then plot them using Flexplot. Why four? Um, 
because there's this fascinating mathematical constant that not many people know about that says that four variables is the most possible variables a data set could have that are predictive of it because that is a universal constant and I am totally lying to you. The reason why is because Flexplot can only visualize four variables at a time. It can do more than that, but it's really hard to interpret what's going on. It's hard with four. So I limit it to four. And then when I plot it, I really, really hope I don't need more than four. Or in other words, I really, really hope that within the top four variables, I've captured all the relevant signal in my data set and anything beyond that is just noise. I'm really hoping for that. And by the way, in my experience, I've used this approach many, many, many times. And I don't know that I've ever encountered a situation. Well, I probably have encountered like one or two situations where four wasn't enough and I needed to go to five, but it's very rare. Usually what happens when you've got a statistical model is you got one variable that soaks up all the variance and then another one that's probably somewhat predictive and then it drastically falls beyond that. And anything more than four is probably just noise. So that's a fatal flaw in my algorithm is, yeah, you're limited to four. So once you identify the top four variables, then you use the plots to figure out uh, any sort of interactions or nonlinear effects. And then using those plots and using the information that you glean from that, you fit a parametric model. And if you want to learn more about um, this procedure, I will leave a link in the description to two papers that kind of together encapsulate this approach. So that's my algorithm. Now, I would be interested to compare my algorithm versus vSurf and see what happens. Okay, I originally was going to do one video, but this recording is taking way longer than I thought it would. So I think I'm gonna break this up into two videos. In the next video, I'm gonna show you in R an example where I look at vSurf versus my approach and see what happens. And as always, if you wanna take a class with me, visit simplistics.net. You can take live classes where you get to interact with me through Zoom, or you could take it at your own pace through a Canvas course. And you can still ask questions of me. It's just digitally. I guess it's all digital. Whether it's video calling with me is digital, as well as typing. Immediate, that's what I'm looking for. If you want immediate feedback through Zoom, it's live class. If you want delayed feedback through a discussion board, then yeah, you could do a self-guided course. Anyway, hope to see you there, and we'll see you next week where I actually run examples in R. Peace out.